Happy Sabbath. Uh, once again, I'm uh, Pastor Jean Cluzet. I teach uh, Bible here at the Academy. I'm also functioning as, uh, as their chaplain, and I'm privileged to be an elder of this church as well. Uh, for those of you that did not uh, catch part one, uh, you're welcome to go and look it up on our, on our website, on our YouTube, and uh, just catch up on that, because there will be some esoteric knowledge that you will have to have because I'll be referencing to some of that stuff today. But uh, we're continuing with Not My Parents' Church, part two. In part one, we um, kind of isolated the seven generations that are alive today. I'm not going to go over that again, but here are the rough divisions. And uh, I would say that about 75 to 80 percent of them are represented here today in this church. Would you not agree? Okay, amen. We got to say amen, right? Every single generation brings its own flavor to church. And um, I, I've been going through these, uh, uh, what I promised was I've been going through these 10 ways that our church will own certain things about itself as we transition into these um, versions of church that we will continue to see. Because can we all agree that my children's church, the, the church that they will lead, right? We're all, we're all sitting here not trying to be consumed in fear and saying, well, I hope there's a church for them then, right? Like, we don't think it's going to implode, right? Because we try to look at prophecy. We like to see things. And God has always his people. But is their church going to be the same as my church? What can we say? Yes or no? Not rhetorical. No, probably not, okay? So, today as it stands, we're going over these 10 different things that we should probably own. So, number one, uh, my church will, be, will own being friend of sinners. Are we known for that? I don't know if we're known for that. Maybe, maybe we should be known for that. Number two, my church will own up to ranking sin. Are we doing that? If yes, we need to dial that back. Number three, my church will own God's designs for sexuality. God has them. They are clear, and they can be found in Genesis 1 and 2. Number four, my church will own a message of repentance. We are called to it. It is core to the gospel. I don't know if you realize that. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near, right? That's, that's the core of the gospel, right? And number five, my church will own truth the right way. And this is the, our, our, jump, uh, our springboard into what we're going to talk about today. We do not, and I want to repeat, we do not get to condemn people. And in, in case you're confused about what condemnation is, is tell them whether or not they're going to make it, right? You get, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. You don't get to do that, okay? So we are going to own the truth the right way. We must be known for how we love and not how we hate, Truth is wonderful, but if it does not come with the grace or the spirit that Jesus was known for, it is not what Jesus was pitching to the woman at the well, John 4. Truth is synonymous with sacrificial love for the sinner. Do you understand? This is what Jesus did. Synonymous with that. Okay, and with that, we go to number, uh, number six. Now, what does the Bible continue to tell us about our lives past salvation. Because I think it's really important for us to isolate that. Last time, um, it kind of hit hard at the end when I gave the example of what I found out in my classrooms as a Bible teacher and where the kids are when it comes to, hey, do I know if I'm going to heaven? Right? It kind of hit hard. That's where we're at. Our kids are not super sure whether or not they're going to heaven, okay? Now, during the summer, I get to still do um, what I like to call pastoral work, and part of that is um, uh, taking part in stories like this. Now, uh, some of you that don't know me, uh, notice that I carry a stick around. It's a pickaxe handle. It's got uh, Proverbs 23, and, uh, 23, 13 inscribed on it to throw people off. But the rest of it is just filled with names over here. And so part of those names are some of these kids. For example, the one on, uh, on the right is Samuela. He got baptized a few weeks back. He decided to get baptized in the early teen division at camp meeting. 
and Samuela's name is over here, right? And that's Pastor Eddie Anderson over here at, uh, at the, I would be at the Chandler Church. Let me point in the right direction, okay? And uh, he got baptized, and he was, he was struggling with this. To his left, to his left is another kid from Tucson who also was struggling with that. He caught me right outside of the bathroom, and he's like, Pastor John, I'm just, I'm just thinking I'm not going to make it to heaven. And at 11.30 at night, I had a full-on Bible study with him right outside the bathrooms, you know, while holding torrents of pee, okay? <laughs> of just like, hey, brother, no, Jesus, Jesus has got you. You can be sure that you're going to heaven. And he was so impressed, he was so impressed with this concept that, I don't know if you can see that in his hand, now he uh, carries that with him wherever he goes. And he's like, I wrote Samuela's name on there as well. And he drove up from Tucson to Chandler to be at his baptism. He says, because I promise I'm going to pray for you. Okay? So I'm just seeing here, it's like, I'm just showing you the screenshots from, uh, from, from their text that they're sending me about this. Uh, the one in the middle is actually from today, oh, what well, today, last night, uh, or yeah, last night today at 1214, he's watching this video, the one sin God will never forgive. This is the guy that got baptized. And at 555 in the morning, I'm like, because he said, dang, Pastor John, I didn't know about this until now. So at 555, I had to watch this 20-minute clip and be like, okay, what is this kid watching? Because I'm telling you, they receive Jesus, and then afterwards, there's a real journey that begins. And how do we follow up with that, okay? Did you watch the whole thing? And, and the video is pretty good. The video is pretty good, and it touches, and, I, and I, I, I'm not going to show you the rest of the screenshots, and I just gave him a whole big, long text, and I was just responding to him and saying, hey, listen, man, the unpardonable sin is, 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 is a very clear thing. And I, and I told him, hey, listen, I talked about that last Sabbath. I'm going to talk about it again today. And it has everything to do with what? The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Correct? Because Jesus very clearly says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 30 through 32, hey, listen, if you blaspheme against the Jesus, the Son of God, hey, it's going to be forgiven you. But I'm telling you, there's one, one that will not be forgiven you. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And what is that? And you ask the question, why can't Satan be forgiven? Can Satan be forgiven? This is why talking about the great controversy is essential. Because if we don't talk about the great controversy, we don't talk about these big themes, and we don't talk about things about living our lives and how Jesus wants to find us when he returns. Correct? Are you guys with me? Okay. All right, let's move. Let's move. All right. Oh, I forgot. Last Sabbath was, um, I forgot, another kid we, we baptized at camp meeting. And uh, his name is not on the stick because this stick is about stories. Right? So he hasn't told me his story, but he decided to follow Jesus. So I'm closely following him via text, via messages, via checking in with his parents, his, uh, his brothers, everything, right? Because I want to know how the story finishes. I want to hear that story. But if that story's on here, it goes with me wherever I go. And I'm excited about it, and I will continue to be a part of it. And that's why I'm here. Right? Because I'm interested in this particular generation, in this particular demographic. I don't know how much longer I'll be influential to that generation and that demographic. I don't know if, like, actually, his older brother told me, Pastor John, you can't say certain things, okay? We're embarrassed for you, okay? All right? He was very kind. I, I really appreciated that because that's, that's truth I needed to hear. Truth I needed to hear. Will I stop saying it? Probably not because I love uncomfortable moments and just when people are just like, ah. They make that face, I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> I said it, and it's uncomfortable, and it makes me laugh. Okay, all right, let's move on. My ADHD is going to get to me, all right? All right, number six, my church will own the possibility of change from the impulse to sin, but admit that it may not go away right away or in this life. Have you stopped to think about that? And I feel like... When we agree with God or that agreeing with God about sin doesn't mean that the impulse for sin goes away. Some argue that it goes away completely after truly accepting Jesus. And a lot of kids don't want to get baptized because they're like, oh, I know what happened to some people when they got baptized because after they got baptized, oh, everything got upheaved. 
most of the worst things I ever did as a teenager came when? Before or after I got baptized? Can somebody finish that story for me? After, right? Uh, because I would hear that. I would hear that from people. You know, after you get baptized, the devil is coming for you twice fault. You know, I'm not going to say which parent told me that, all right? <laughs> but I grew up with that, thinking about that, and then when it happened, oh, there it is. Oh, well, I'm never going to live that life. I'm too bad. Some people will actually, and that's what the video that he sent was saying, some people, some parents will actually say, well, I'm beyond saving, but I want my kids to be saved. I just went on a visit this Thursday for a parent that called me, Pastor Jean. It was a Spanish visit. Uh, the parent, because I, we have a lot of Spanish students, and I'm actually getting to speak at a Spanish church next Sabbath. And, and, and in Spanish, like, my, my kid's really afraid. I need you to come and talk to him. I've had parents come and talk to me and say, can you talk to my child? Because I, I want them to be saved. I was like, you do realize that I don't have those magical powers, right? Like, this is a Jesus thing, and we need to, you know, create an environment together where Jesus kind of shows up. Correct? Now, so when you have this mentality, you always run into severe problems when inevitably a version of that sin or whatever it is rears its ugly head here or there. And people who struggle with this reality have, have a level of confusion about what I like to call the Asians. Because I grew up in a church being her, my, my kids' ages and hearing all of these big words that if you use them in real life, like, I don't know, people will look at you crooked because we don't use, for example, the word justification. And I call them the Asians. And the Asians kind of govern how you live your life. The Asians. How, how many of you have ever used justification in context in a regular conversation outside of church? Awesome. Amazing. See, you see the percentage of people that did? All right, I, I have too, but I'm weird, right? All right, sorry, I, I just hyper-focused on you. I'm sorry. All right? So justification, it's a one-time event, all right? The Bible tells us it's a one-time event. It was paid by Jesus on the cross that clears us of the guilt of sin. Yes or no? Everybody understands what that is? Romans 3.28 tells us, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Thank God. Can we say amen? Because if it wasn't so, we'd have some severe, severe problems. Now, the next one is called sanctification, which is a lifelong event in the process of becoming holy by exposure to the Spirit and the Word. Now, sanctification, most of us don't really say that very much. Sanctification, uh, those of us that speak Spanish, we kind of connect with it a little bit because it's the root of it is from the Latin, which means sanctus or sanctum, right, which means holy. So it's basically, you should look at it as the holification, right? In the Bible, things could be holy, places could be holy, and people could be holy. What makes them holy? The presence of God. Take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. What, what made that desert, that wilderness ground holy? The bush? The rocks? No, the presence of God. Okay? So it's a lifelong event, the process of becoming holy by exposure to the Spirit and the Word. Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. Exposure to God's presence. And a lot of the time, the kids are like, well, what should we do to be a good Christian? They're like, well, we should pray. We should read our Bibles. Yes, absolutely. You should do all of those things. But the way that we say it kind of holds us back because no kid's like, well, I, you know, sometimes when they think of a holy person, what do they think? You know, like that's, that's what they think, right? Of a holy person that's set aside and it's all of a sudden. And one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I never wanted to be a pastor when I was a teenager was because I didn't want to become one of those people. I don't want to sell out. I know what those people are behind closed doors, right? I had that in my core. So, a lifelong event. And the final one is called glorification, a one-time event at the end of time that finally changes us physically to survive in God's presence. Because right now, can we stand in the, in the presence of God? No, cannot survive the experience. Our, our outside finally reflects the change that has already begun on the inside in this imperfect world. And in 2 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. But what happens? 
How many of you have run into people that tell you, hey, before Jesus comes back, you know, there's this special group of people that might actually achieve glorification, right? And I, I don't know. I grew up with some of that in my head. And a lot of the times, it's very damaging because the kids are like, okay, they, they're confused. They think baptism might do that. And by the way, do you need baptism to be saved? No, you do not. Mark 16, 16 says, those that believe and are baptized, they shall be saved. But those that do not believe, it omits baptism, right, will not be saved. The thief on the cross, was he baptized? No, but Jesus, I tell you the truth. I'm telling the truth today. You will be with me in paradise. Should you get baptized? 100%. But what's the purpose of baptism? It's the first time you preach your sermon. That's what it is. So is there a question about baptism and whether or not you've accepted Jesus? Absolutely. I get that. But do you understand all of these little extra levels that we're putting on people's heads about what the gospel and how simple it is? Okay. So my church will own the possibility of change from the impulse to sin, but admit that it may not go away right away or in this life. Justification, one-time event. Sanctification, lifelong event. I die daily, says Paul. Correct? Glorification, one-time event. Second coming, yay! <laughs> right? Jesus coming back, I'm so excited. Boom, I'm changed. In the blink of an eye, I've been changed. Yes? Glorification. We're, everybody's with me? Excellent. Now, when I go back to Samuela and what he said this morning, okay, I have to, I have to be reminded at all times that I have to, as a person who is every day being sanctified, have to help other people with that same process. Are adults immune to this particular problem that my buddy Samuela is having? Absolutely not. How many of you wake up in the morning and generally feel like trash about yourself? Nobody's raising their hands. Only the kids who are honest are going like this, okay? Nobody that feels like trash is like, me, I feel like trash. <laughs> and they, you know, gleefully raise their hand outside of the kids. A child shall lead them, right? I'm not expecting people to respond. But that's why I like working with these generations, because they will. They will tell you the truth. And the older we are, what do we do? We stop telling the truth. We stop being open about the truth which makes me a really abrasive pastor depending on who is talking to me because I speak truth and I'm very open about my truth. And sometimes for some people, it's like, hey, you need to dial it back because my idea of a pastor needs to be this person that all the time feeling great, doing great. No, but pastors are what? Are they normal people? They sure are. So be kind to Pastor Dave, all right? You don't have to be kind to me. Be kind to Pastor Dave. Absolutely. We are all in this together. So, like cancer, the effects of sin can still affect us even if we have faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? People that believe in God still die of cancer. Ultimately experiencing freedom from the disease physically on resurrection morning. The same thing can happen when, with the sinful impulses of our hearts. I have been redeemed and justified by Jesus on the cross. Praise God. I am being sanctified by the Holy Spirit every day. But like Paul said, look at what he says. I was given a thorn in my side, a messenger from Satan that makes me suffer. Three times I begged the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is all you need. My power is strongest when you are weak, so I am very happy to brag about how weak I am. Then Christ's power can work in me. Does this sound like sanctification struggles to you? It does to me. How many, can you, how many of you can relate to Paul's thorn on his side? All right? And don't get into that weird place where like, oh, he was blind, oh, he was this, oh, he was homosexual, oh, you know. And I've heard all of it. People trying to guesstimate what was the thorn on his side that he asked God to take away. Now, just because Paul says this and guessing what that thorn may have been and how he dealt with that thorn, 
to me, is biblically irresponsible. Saying that he longed for glorification and the physical freedom it would bring is not biblically irresponsible. Correct? Do we all resonate with that last part? Do you long for glorification? We are seventh day what? So we long for the what? The glorification. Bring it on, Jesus. I want to get out of here. It's been over 110 degrees for a long time. And that's the light one, and it gets the nervous laugh. <laughs> right? But there's other things that are burning up in your life that you would like to get rid of, that you would like for them to go away. Peter was that xenophobic all his life. God had to send him a dream of many animals to help him out. Paul puts him on blast in front of the Galatians about it. He was prejudiced for the same reason he denied Jesus three times. He was a people pleaser and afraid of what certain people would think of him. He performed miracles, preached the gospel, expelled demons. Does it look like he ever got over his xenophobia? Does God still use him? Yes, please remember this. And kids need to hear this. It doesn't matter how you're messed up. There is something that God expects from us, but the mess up doesn't stop you from doing what God asks you to do. And there's a bunch of people that will not do the job I'm doing. They won't become teachers. They won't become pastors or anything like that because, well, I got to get to a certain level before I do that. Yikes. If that's true, then you're never going to do it. Why? Because you're not going to get there. Okay? Okay. I, have a, I had a student this last year who was struggling with the why of what God allows people to suffer. God's, God's so mean. He's so unfair. I can't believe it. He could just he could be like Thanos and snap his fingers, right? Some, some people understood that reference. And everything would be great, right? And he's just angry, like angry. Angry, angry, angry texts, angry messages, angry journal entries. Why? Why, God having all his power, would he allow all of these things? Sometimes our struggle allows us to be the one that was redeemed by the walls of the temple. It allows us to remember our need for Jesus on a daily basis. There is no path to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit than saying, I'm good. I don't need God. I don't need this situation. You know what? I might be better than God because I would do it differently if I was God. Before I read this text, I want to share a story with you. So back when I had churches, <clears throat> um, we practiced an open door policy and uh, we had some elders that were really into like street ministries and and just bringing people off the street. And I do remember, um, and if you haven't been praying, pray for me already because a lot of the things that I share, they're very real, like, like um, my brother Osenia here prayed about, right? They're very real, but at the same time, oh, people haven't had these experiences. They haven't had these situations. And so there was this uh, one man who was transitioning and uh, one day showed up on Sabbath, had been coming every Sabbath, and uh, came in f fully dressed as a woman, and, uh, you know, bra was stuffed and everything, still kind of had a five o'clock shadow, but was wearing a, a sign that said, Marie. And everything is fine because we practice open door policy. This is the kind of people we want in church because, you know, we're, we're here to preach the gospel to everybody. But then I went downstairs where the kids' divisions were, and he was going around to the different divisions and leaning down or kneeling down and going up to the little kids and being like, hey, you have to call me Marie. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, yikes. Okay, it's going to be a little tougher. I don't know if my elders can do this or want to do this. I'm sure they can, but I have to probably address this. And I went and I was like, hey, Marie, come over here. Hey, 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 I got to talk to you. Is there a chance that we can meet together and maybe at a coffee shop or something like that and just maybe talk it out because I, I'm sorry, but I don't think you get to tell kids that. I mean, I think their parents have a right to tell the kids those things. I mean, I respect, 
I, I, I respect your, your courage for doing it, all these other things, but let's talk about it. Let's, um, let's find out where this comes from and why, why you, you have this need to, to have people recognize you this way. And, it's, and it, it, it was what it was, you know. And so I show up at this coffee shop. Uh, I meet up with, with Marie, and we end up having a Bible study about the gospel because I was like, man, I don't know what else to do. I don't have a Bible study for a person who's transitioning. All right? What, what's the Bible study? Somebody show me. All right? <laughs> Outside of Matthew 19, which is not a Bible study, it's just a reference about Jesus talking about eunuchs, I don't have anything else. All right? This is a person who's married, had three kids, was going through a divorce. Right? It's, it was a tough situation. It's a real situation. And I'm sitting there, and in the middle of the conversation, when I get to the part of Jesus dying for us on the cross, he stops me, and, uh, and uh, I'm, still, I'm still trying to figure out whether I should say he or she or, or whatever, right? Because like, I want to respect people. Can we respect people and say the, the right thing, or do we address people biologically and, and speak down truth to them? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. Right? There's a lot of people trying to figure it out. But one thing that stood out is like when I got to that part about Jesus— Marie said, he stopped me. They stopped me, and they were like, wait, I just want to say something. I never asked Jesus to die for me. I don't need to be saved. I'm a good person. And that's where my Bible study ended. Because that's where the truth you need to get to. You need to get to the heart of the issue. Where is that person in front of God? When they go through and they stand in front of God, where are they? And it'll reveal, because there are people that are going through that situation that are doing it out of the kindness. I mean, like, they're super genuine. They're, they absolutely are convinced of these things, right? And Jesus in, in Matthew 19 said, some were born that way, some were made that way, some chose to be that way. Correct? He says that. So we have to get to that place. Where are you? Where are you? Who are you when you stand at the foot of the cross? Who is that person that stands in front of the cross? I don't care what sin brought you there, right? Should we care what sin brought them there? All right. We should not care. But we should care about what they say about God's saving power and what they teach the little ones to do. And Jesus was very clear about that. Yes? Some of the harshest harshest warnings from Jesus was, hey, careful what you're teaching and what you're teaching others to do. Now, my churches will always own the possibility of change from the impulse to sin, but admit that it may not go away right away or in this life. When we allow our reaction to our pet sin or our inability to feel any other way to define who we are, we deny what Jesus accomplishes in the most holy place right now. How much more, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If you define yourself by sin, you deprive yourself of being defined as being cleansed by Jesus. When we identify as sin instead of sinners, we handicap our ability to take our imperfections to God constantly. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not an attack on any particular group because heterosexuals do this all the time, okay? How many of you know somebody that finds amazing little ways to excuse their heter heterosexual perversion? Some heterosexuals that don't share this perspective with me really dislike another connection I make with sin. I consider my sin an addiction, so at every church I had, I would always run N.A. or A.A., Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous. And I loved it because I would go there with them and I would sit. I wouldn't get to participate because I didn't have that particular thing, but I would be there in support, opening up the doors, and sometimes my elders and, and my church board was like, but what if they come and steal stuff? Because, you know, when you have N.A., you know, there's a very clear chance some of these people cannot help themselves. And yeah, we lost a couple soundboards, but... <laughs> <laughs> but we had to, <laughs> we had to I, I, I preferred having the doors open. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is that every meeting would start with what? Every person that got up, got up there and said, Hi, my name is Jean, and I am a... I am what I am. I'm an addict. Imagine if church were that place. 
Hi, my name is Jean, and I'm a sinner. I'm saying it to you today. I'm not using it as an example. Hi, my name is Jean, and I'm a sinner. And you say? Hi, Jean. Thank you. Thank you. Goosebumps. Oh, thank you. You know, that's actually started in churches. And then they had to leave churches. Why? Because churches are toxic, okay? <laughs> and they left the churches. And then when they left the churches, they were like, well, we got to get rid of this God thing. And they tried it without God for, I think, almost a decade. And then they had to do, guess what? Come back to God or a higher power, as they like to call it. Because there's no accountability. No, there's no way that that works without God. It's very interesting. I want it back. Do you want it back? I do. I want it back. Everyone in that room knew what their condition was. And everyone in that room knew what they needed. They needed help from somebody else. They needed help from a higher power. They needed accountability. And they were there for accountability. Number seven, my church will own the beauty of the good news about grace. Whenever Jesus dealt with someone in sexual sin, he never started with the sin. He always started with the cause. In John 4, Jesus doesn't condemn the woman at the well with her multi-husband sin. He identifies her problem with thirst. And then the solution was eternal thirst quenching from Jesus. Those of us that want sex and crave it, some don't, they want it because we want to feel whole, unknown, accepted, relieved, and or loved. And if we don't receive those things from it, we almost always go searching for a source that will combine our chemical satisfaction with our psychological or even our spiritual one. In John 8, Jesus said something to the woman in adultery that I almost never say to myself or others. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. My first reaction is always to condemn until they stop sinning. And I grew up that way. No, Jesus did the opposite. I hope we can grasp the weight of what Jesus did with these two victims of sexual impulse. Also, we have no record if they actually sinned no more. Is there a verse that follows up with that? No, we don't, but Jesus said it. He did say it. How many young women did we lose as a church because we didn't do this right when they got pregnant outside of marriage. This is what happens when he helped God with condemnation. Not even Jesus did that. The only one that had a right to didn't do it. How many people have we lost to porn because instead of pointing out the, the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we told them that they had to work super hard to stop before that work would be available to them? Should they stop? Yes, as a chorus. Yes. But is that the message that you say first? No. You take them to Jesus. You take them to Jesus. If you're in the middle of something sexual, right, for married people or unmarried people, and your mom walks in, I always use this example with all of my young people, and some people are like, oh, I can't believe he's saying that stuff. In fact, I, I had people call the conference office when I addressed all the sexual questions in chapel this year. Because I, I say it. They're talking about it. Let's talk about it from the Bible. What if you're in the middle of that and your mom walks in or any other authority figure, does that mean that your access to the hormones that are making you feel that way have been removed from your life? No. Your awareness of their presence changes everything. My church will own the beauty of the good news about grace. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do you understand what he's saying there? If you love, you will keep. It's a relationship thing. If you love me, keep my commandments. The first four are about loving God. The last six are about loving people. My church will own the beauty of the good news about grace. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What is the day of Jesus Christ, my Seventh-day Adventists? The second coming. So he is going to work with you. And the only way that that works is with holiness. What was holiness? The presence of of God in your life. If mom walks in and you're doing naughty things, what do you stop doing? Naughty things. Everything in your home is like, oh no, mom's here, right? 
<laughs> Even if you're married, some of you are uncomfortably laughing, you should laugh. It's okay to laugh at church, in church, around church, outside of church. So, thinking about these things is incredibly, incredibly important. I was speaking at a men's retreat about purity, and I kid you not, I kid you not, an 80-year-old widower wanted to talk to me afterwards about some struggles that he was having. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, and I was in my 20s, which uh, I don't know why I was talking about that in my 20s. Anyway, every time I come to camp meeting, pastor, every time I come to camp meeting, there's all these widows throwing their vibes my way. What do I do? I don't think I can reject them all. And part of me is like doing what, you know, Dennis is doing right now. I wanted to laugh, but it was serious, and there's other people there, and I'm like, okay. But he was super serious. He was almost at the point of tears, and that's kind of what brought me back. God helps us with something that we cannot help. It's kind of like when the switch goes on, you know, the one where you're in the thick of it and you got all of those fun chemicals in your brains that God made, some which are stronger than heroin, to be enjoyed in a committed relationship as designed in Genesis 2.24. What's the only thing that can stop what that switch unleashed? Being confident of this very thing. The presence of Jesus in your life, unlike your mom and guilt, changes everything. The presence of Jesus is based on love and an invitation and not an invasion. What are you doing? Unlike your mom walking in on you at the wrong time. 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out fear. And so this is a text that we mentioned last time. I'm not going to read it in the interest of time, all of it. But check out that last part, right? The first part is like all these people that don't get to go into heaven, right? And we've used that to excuse some terrible things, right? The last part says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Isn't that great? That's good news. It's shareable good news. Something to share with everybody else. Number eight, my church will own our fear of suffering for the sake of Jesus. Who did Jesus call the greatest prophet to be ever born? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Can we, admit, can we admit that we are not suffering like John the Baptist did? We are not, okay? But there's a lot of our people in our church are like, got to run to the hills. Got to make sure I avoid the suffering that is coming because of the prophecies and all this other stuff, okay? And we kind of ignore and maybe even toss to the side all the people that are suffering inside of families that are toxic. We are... Tossing to the side all these people that are going tribulations and temptations that you have no idea. I would say maybe 60 to 75% of the names that are on this stick are kids that are going through things that you cannot possibly imagine. And then you tell that kid, well, get ready. When Jesus comes back, we're going to have to run to the hills. They're already running to the hills in their own house, in their own school with their friends, with what maybe a relative did to them. When we share truth, does it cause people to toss us in jail? And as a matter of fact, John was tossed in jail because he confronted some leadership positions about their sexual sin. Yes or no? Yes. Yikes. And you could, we could have said to John, John, stop pointing fingers. Let God be the judge. If you left those infidels alone, you'd be out of jail. There's, there's a reason why Jesus called this guy the greatest prophet that had ever been born. This is what Paul said. That's why I'm suffering the way I am, but I'm not ashamed. I know the one who I have believed. I am sure he's able to take care of what I have given him. I can trust him with it until the day he comes back. This, do these guys sound like Seventh-day Adventists? Unsure of what's going on? I, ooh, a lot of things are happening in my life, but hey, I gave it to God, and I'm trusting him until the day I come back. One of the main problems we have with Seventh-day Adventists is because Jesus hasn't come back yet. 
Have you ever stopped to think about that? Right? Both of my grandfathers went to their graves saying, oh, Jesus is coming back in my lifetime. And I looked at their lives and I thought they lived perfect lives. I have no idea what they did right or wrong because they didn't talk about those things back then. I know what I did wrong and a lot of times it's like, well, I don't, I don't think I'm going to have room in that kingdom because I'm not living the lives that those grandparents lived. Every single kid I've met over here and, and you compound that with what? Generation Z is what? Completely afraid of taking chances, of taking risks. Uh, my conversation with the young man on Thursday was like, uh, I don't know what to do with my future. I, uh, I don't want to disappoint my parents because they're, they're paying for my education. And, 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 and if I go to college, what if I don't like what I'm doing? What if, what if the place is it's just a place that's, that's going to tear me away from God? I'm, I'm so afraid that I'm going to waste their money. And I'm like, all education is good. You need to walk with Jesus. Imagine. Have you talked to kids that went through COVID and had school and then they came back to school? I had a nice little generation of them graduate last year. A lot of things going on. A lot of things going on. And most of it driven by fear. And when you get over fear, if you get over fear without Jesus, what do you do? You become cynical, you become angry, and you become combative, and you attach morality to the wrong things. My church will not own a message focused on fighting sin. Here's my final testimony here. Why should we not own a message focused on fighting sin? Let me tell you why. False religion is just outside the door if this becomes a strategy. Reminder from last week, right? What is false religion? Genesis 4, one brother brings sacrifice, or an offering. One of those is accepted. One of those is rejected. What's false religion? Dear Jesus, dear Lord, please accept all the good things that I have so that I can be brought closer to you. True religion says what? Thank you, Lord, for what you did for me. Here is a representation of me thanking you for what you did for me. Okay? Every single false religion is you trying to get yourself to the next level. Okay? That's what it is. So when we fight sin, we get dangerously close to that. This is probably my most successful Bible study in recent memory. This is Alex, and I also I actually texted both of the people, all of the people that I have on the pictures here. They know that I'm talking about them today. And Alex is a professional street dancer. That's a 40-year-old man, let me just tell you right now. He's the same age as I am. This guy is in shape. When I met him, different girl every night, right? Drugs. Uh, they were actually using the dance thing as a front to maybe side deal drugs while they were getting money from people on the street. This is in in, um, what do we call that place that we don't like? Waikiki, right? <laughs> well, the place where everybody goes, lots of money, lots of drunk people, all these other things. And this is, this is what his ministry, not ministry, sorry, I jumped the gun, because he now does have a ministry, which is amazing, right? And this is, this is kind of where I met him, this is who he was, rough, cussing up a storm. Uh, it was all about money, all his pictures with him and all the Benjamins, right? But check this out, cross-generational ministry. I didn't baptize him. Some older people did. Just showing that ministry, showing Jesus' presence in his life. He understood it, and he got baptized. Now this is what his Instagram looks like, okay? Jesus of Nazareth follower, entertainer, performer, founder of Unity Crew LA and Aloha Dancers. He wants to become a minister for God now. And the crazy part is in that Bible study, I never brought sin to him. All I did was open up the Bible and start sharing Seventh-day Adventist truth. I, it was prophetic. It was, it was all of these other things, but I was going through the basic things and just completely saying, hey, listen, if you have questions about this, let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible is telling you. And he would have his morning devotions, and all of a sudden he was like, you know what? I'm depending way too much on coffee. And some of you guys love coffee, and it's fine, and I don't care. But he was like, I didn't tell him anything about this because, like, I, this is how far into Adventism he went without Ellen White. He was like, I, I'm, wake, I'm, I'm needing coffee to wake up. I don't think God wants me to rely on anything other than him. I think I need to be celibate until God brings me the woman he has prepared for me. I never went that hard. And lo and behold, now this is who he is. He preaches a sermon before and after each one of the performances. He vetted all of his dancers so that there are people that respect, either respect God or are able to represent God with, with their lives and their lifestyles. I told him, 
I told him none of these things. And why is it my most successful Bible study ever? Not, not because he's going to be a pastor, but because I didn't do anything. <laughs> because God did everything. All we did was open up the Bible together. Texted me two weeks ago, how are you doing, brother? I'm, I'm really praying for you. I don't know if you're struggling with the same things. Oh, that's the other thing I did. I was real with my struggles. Right? Even though for him it was like, oh, there's not the same level of struggles as mine. Finally, number 10, pray for me. My church will own a message focused on how all our lives continue to change because Jesus is Lord. Is the Sabbath a massive issue of neglect and sin in this world? Not rhetorical. Is the Sabbath a massive, a massive issue of neglect and sin in this world? Yes. Is the Sabbath a sign of those who truly worship the Creator? Yes. Does keeping the Sabbath get you into heaven? Correct view on sex, correct view on Sabbath, or even coveting, arguably, probably one of the hardest commandments to keep, does not improve our position with Jesus or in heaven. So what are we going to do? How are we going to react when a pastor says they are gay, bisexual, trans, etc.? Recently, a pastor, this is in March, did just that in Germany, came out as bisexual, and he's still pastoring, single, celibate, as far as I understand, and still pastoring. Many are horrified, and many are clapping. The Bible says, to the law and to the testimony, if they don't speak according to these words, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible, or Jesus, at the end of the only sermon he preached, he says, you will know them by their fruits. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So what are we going to do? What are those fruits? The gospel will be preached to all the world, and then the end will come. We love because he first loved us. That's the difference. Not that one is a pastor and one is not. Not that one preaches about a, a changed life through the power of Jesus to anyone that will listen, or that the other celebrates Jesus accepting him as he is. Both struggle with their sexuality. Both had terrible decisions to make, and in the end, their fruits will show for themselves. Their stories are not over, and we have to trust that God will sort it out at the end. As far as I know, because he's personal, he's, he's somebody I know, he's my friend, he is bearing fruit. And that, to me, is incredibly encouraging. Part of me, like, after the Bible study, was like, oh, what is he going to do? I mean, like, it's kind of hard, you know, at 40, who, what kind of girls is he going to find in the church? You know, a 40-year-old going around talking to girls with that kind of background, like, you know, already trying to finish the story for him, trying to get, no, that's none of my business. God's going to do it in the same way that God transformed his heart. The other story, I'm way too far removed. Is that a real thing? Is that going to be more for my children's church? Absolutely, but I don't have any business saying what God will do and won't do. Remember what Jesus said. My church will own a message focused on how all our lives continue to change because Jesus is Lord. The owner's servants came to him. They said, sir, didn't you plant good seed in this field? Then why, where did the weeds come from? And the owner said, an enemy did this. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull the weeds up? No, the owner answered. While you were pulling up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the workers what to do. God's going to do it, guys. God's going to do it, and I believe it. So, what is my job? And this is kind of my mantra right here. This is my favorite verse when it comes to pastoring. I'm free. I don't belong to anyone. But I make myself a slave to everyone. I do it to win as many as I can to Christ. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. That was to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one that was under the law, even though I myself am not under the law. That was to win those that are under the law. To the Gentiles, who don't have the law, I became like one who doesn't have the law. I'm not free from God's law. I'm under Christ's law. Now I can win over those who don't have the law. To those who are weak, I became weak. That was to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that in all possible ways I might save some. I do all of that because of the good news. Amen? 
How many friends do you have that you agree with and disagree with? Have you taken an inventory of that? It's very important that you take an inventory of that. Because our conversations are never going to evolve. Our, 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 our ministry is never going to evolve to be able to be effective for the next generation if we don't have cross-communication. And I feel that that's missing. And I feel like that's what they look at us and like, they say, oh, well, well, they're not really talking. They're not really having the conversations that we're having. So, number one, we will look for ways to love those that sin differently than us. Number two, because of that, we will stop comparing who sins worse than me. Number three, we will be honest about sexuality, God's design for it, and how, is, how, how merciful He is when we mess up in that area, no matter how we mess up. Number four, we must repent because, because the kingdom of God is near. Amen? Number five, we must worship in spirit and in truth. Anything less and we end up hurting fellow sinners either because we pull back on truth or we don't have enough spirit to love them. And number six, you justified once, sanctified lifelong, glorified one time. We must die daily to sin in our previous life. We must fight our concept of perfection with Jesus' Jesus' perfection in us. Number seven, we must constantly remind each other of God's grace because if not, we slip into false religion where we try to make our own grace. And you cannot do that. Number eight, if we have this truth and spirit, Jesus promises that we will suffer for his sake because the world will hate us, both the ones that condemn sin and the ones who excuse it. I have lived this. I am hated by, by both, uh, at times, I am hated by both quote-unquote conservative and quote-unquote liberal. I hate, hate those labels. All they do is divide. Jesus is the most conservative liberal I've ever met. Have you stopped to look at Jesus' ministry? I hope you have, because he's bananas. Number nine, instead of fighting Instead of fighting it, the sin, we will lead people to the transformative power of his presence in our lives daily. Number 10, why? Because God will change them from within. And that will be something we will celebrate together with our former enemies. Even the thousand years in heaven will be filled with this joy. In Revelation 20, Brother Dennis and I were talking after the sermon, and we realized that, you know, like the, the realization no more tears, no more suffering isn't until Revelation 21. There's a thousand years in heaven of asking why and crying about it. That's Seventh day Adventism. We talk about real things from a logical and loving perspective from the Bible. You're right, it's not my parents' church. It's Jesus' church. And how is that church populated? With my favorite verse in the Bible. Look, I'm standing at your door and I'm knocking. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and I will do what? By the way, potluck after church, letting you know. I will eat with you. Jesus is knocking on everybody's door. Is our multi-generational church a place where they can hear that knocking? Or are we being too loud for them to hear the knocking of Jesus? The message we have to share with people is very, very simple. It's cross-generational. It will not change. Our church might change, but the message will not. Who here is ready to share an unchanging message with people you love very much or people you hate very much. I know I am, and I will be challenged. And if you ever see me slipping up, what do I want you to do? Keep me accountable because I, Pastor Jean, am a sinner. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you have taken someone like me and made him holy. Thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for the holiness that I feel here right now. I thank you for filling those spaces. Heavenly Father, more often than not, when we leave this place, we're going to kick you out. 
Um, it might be later this afternoon. It might be tomorrow. I want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for your mercy and your grace. Because even though we do that on the daily, you still come back and knock on our door. And you still want to have a meal with us. Heavenly Father, I pray that you help us with the knowledge of that grace and that mercy. Share the truth with somebody else that we are too afraid to sit down and have a meal with. Because you're not too afraid to have a meal with us. And I want you to help us remember. I pray for every single mom, dad, child, cousin, grandma, grandpa, auntie, and uncle. Every single colleague, every single coworker, every single person that is hearing this message so that we all can come together cross-generationally to bring others to you. The time is short. We love you. We miss you. We want to see you very soon. Amen.